Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, if you recall, the last time I was talking about counting loops, and I will uh, counting index loops in uh, large NQCD. Uh, but before uh, before I return to this subject, I wanted to do the following. I wanted to explain a little bit better what I meant by this uh, funny cubic ON model above four dimensions that I was talking about, because I realized that there was, uh, I didn't get maybe some uh, points across. So let me just uh, clarify this, uh, clarify uh, the ON model in uh, D between 4 and 6 with interactions with interactions of the following form G1 over 2 sigma phi i phi i plus G2 over 6 sigma cube right so what I explained is that if you just formally compute um, compute the beta functions, there is a perturbative real zero, perturbative real uh, zero of, of the beta functions beta one and beta two uh, in six minus epsilon dimensions, provided uh, for n bigger than 1038, right? And then I was saying something about, so when we do this calculation, we work <coughs> in a completely per perturbative vacuum, right? We're expanding around sigma equals zero and phi equals zero. So we're working around, uh, working around the sigma equals zero, phi equal phi i equal to zero vacuum. So I'm not doing anything mysterious like uh, finding some mysterious other minimum of this uh, of this potential for sigma, uh, just just doing the basic calculation. And then I was <coughs> so I was trying then to claim that uh, that this vacuum that we find is actually meta stable. Okay, and this may seem surprising, right? Because naively the potential is uh, is just an inflection point, right? So it doesn't seem to have any quadratic term. Uh, but let me just say the following thing, which uh, may be familiar to some of you. That uh, so the the question is, does this define some kind of conformal field theory with? Uh, some uh, scaling dimensions we can compute at this point, right? So one general fact about CFT, general fact about uh, CFT is, uh, is that energies on uh, the scaling dimensions, scaling dimensions are the same as uh, energy energy levels energy levels on a cylinder on a cylinder right <coughs> so if you if any of you have ever read the string theory book this is uh, something that appears very early on right because if you for example let's just consider the d equal to conformal field theory. In other words, you uh, and work on Euclidean plane, right? So when you work on Euclidean plane, Euclidean uh, plane, and often you use complex coordinates, you know, z and z bar for this plane. <coughs> People usually talk about so-called radial ordering or radial quantization. Namely, when you have the origin around which the vacuum is defined, and then you 
instead of time ordering, you order operators according to how far from, uh, from the origin these operators are. So there is some notion of radial ordering. And this becomes completely clear where it comes from when we uh, make a wild transformation from, from uh, this plane to a cylinder, right? The feature of, of a conformal field theory is that you can perform any wild transformation. So you can perform, so let's think about the metric. So the metric uh, here on the plane is just ds squared, which is equal to dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. Right, theta is just, so this is the radius, and, uh, and theta is just the angle, right? Theta parameterizes the circle S1, right? Then you perform the wild transformation by uh, multiplying this by just 1 over r squared, right? It's an allowed wild transformation, so, so th you do this... Uh, well, transformation to the metric, which is 1 over r squared times dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. Okay, uh, and then you basically get uh, the following metric. Then what this does is that this decouples the circle, and then you get dr over r squared plus d theta squared. Okay, and now you can introduce the coordinate, for example, uh, if you define r is equal to e to the tau, then this is just uh, equal to d tau squared plus d theta squared. And this is just the metric on the cylinder, right? So, so this describes just the cylinder with, with, uh, with this tau coordinate. And, and you can think of this as a propagation of a string, right? You just have a string, closed string, parameterized by a circle with a Euclidean time tau. And then you see that this radial ordering on the plane corresponds to the time ordering on the cylinder, which is what we usually do. And then if you want to find the scaling, the so the theory that you can, for example, study a very simple theory, just uh, uh, integral d to just a free massless scalar field, one half d d mu phi squared, and find the energy levels, and this will correspond to the scaling dimensions of this. So, so the the basic thing is that once you compute the energies on the uh, on the cylinder, that actually gives you the scaling dimensions of of the operator. So delta, if you say that this theta ranges from uh, theta ranges from zero to two pi, then delta, the scaling dimension that I talked about last time, is just equal to these energies on the cylinder. Okay. But now, so why am I saying all this? Is that because um, when you go to higher dimensions, for example, here I, I'm interested in being in five dimensions, but you can, you can also, do even in three dimensions this kicks in, is that this action here is not sufficient to describe a free conformal field theory. In fact, in d dimensions, to have a while invariant action, you need, uh, you need to add a so-called improvement term, which is, uh, goes as follows. So now to properly couple this theory to, to geometry, we have to write it like this. We have to say that this is integral d, d dx, square root of determinant of g, one half d mu sigma d nu sigma g mu nu plus one quarter d minus two over d minus one r sigma squared. So 
So only this action actually is properly while invariant. And this has to do with this improved uh, energy momentum tensor. Essentially, the way, uh, are some of you familiar with this? Uh, it's, it's basically, whenever you study even free field theory and curved space, you see like in flat space, this, this will go to zero and you recover what you knew before. This is the Ricci scalar. Ricci scalar of the geometry. Right, the reason this is needed is this paper I mentioned by Callan Coleman Jakiv, right? That uh, once you vary this, uh, and uh, and uh, look at um, this improved energy momentum tensor, uh, namely if you vary with respect to the metric, and you say that delta of S is equal to integral d dx uh, square root of g t mu nu delta g mu nu, this action produces a different stress energy tensor because the metric appears also here. And without this term, you very clearly see that you will not get a traceless stress energy tensor. It's important to have a traceless stress. Uh, it's a very simple uh, exercise to show that this, this alone will not give you a traceless stress energy tensor. Right? Does everyone see it? It's uh, basically you will get that. Uh, uh, so ju just from here, from this term, you will basically get that t mu nu is equal to d mu nu d mu nu phi d mu phi d nu phi minus one half uh, g mu nu d phi squared. And this, this comes from, this term here comes from varying the metric and this term comes from varying the square root g. So when you take the trace, right, t mu nu, g mu nu, you see that you, you will get uh, d phi squared, um, that's d phi squared, times 1 minus d over 2. So in two dimensions it works, right? But anywhere away from two dimensions it does not work. That's why you need this extra term here. But then this term actually, so suppose I'm interested in computing the energy levels of some theory on the scalar field theory on the cylinder. <coughs> I really have to start with this term even for this f action of the sigma field. And then you see that what's going to happen is that this will give you effectively a, uh, a sigma square, um, plus sigma squared contribution as if it's a mass term, right? So, so you can play exactly the same game in any dimension D. Right, so, so when you do it like uh, uh, d-dimensional. So if you start with CFT on RD, and if you want to map it to, so now you have the metric of a d minus one dimensional sphere, right? This is d omega d minus one. This is metric of S d minus one, right? Then this whole manipulation goes through as before, and you get this. Uh, so now the cylinder is higher dimensional, right? It's as if you uh, you have a sphere and you sweep it along this extra tau direction, right? But because now at fixed tau the space is, has curvature, you get a non-zero R, right? So therefore, for such a theory on a cylinder, th there already is a quadratic term. So, so the classical potential, classical potential in sigma direction now looks like this, right? It's, it's basically, uh, 
and if the coupling so you see that this perturbative vacuum got kind of shored up by this uh, this term and effectively this uh, it's easiest to see it on the cylinder but effectively it even shows up on a plane when you compute appropriate quantities so the instability so you're fine working in this perturbative vacuum and the problem is just tunneling from here to here so you have this tunneling so uh, some uh, so decay via tunneling via tunneling so the decay rate turns out to be really of order e to the minus a constant times n so it's not just uh, per suppressed by 1 over n it's very strongly suppressed by by n right exponentially suppressed yeah, so yes why is it so important to have a theory with the Energy momentum tensor in this well, we are in all this business uh, implicit in what I was doing is the search for fixed points of RG, right? Fixed points of RG give you certainly scale invariant series, but then if scale invariance is promoted to full while invariance or conformal invariance, uh, then, then you have uh, fully conformal field theory. So for example, we believe that all these theories, like the three-dimensional easing model that I discussed, 3D ON model, all of them are essentially proven to be conformal field theories. They're not just fixed points of RG, they're invariant under this uh, full conformal group. And in fact, this whole conformal bootstrap approach that I was mentioning is based on assumption that these series are conformally invariant. Because then you use this full machinery of conformal symmetry of this theory. Without it, conformal bootstrap would be totally meaningless. But as I mentioned, they obtain these tiny islands that are completely in agreement with the epsilon expansion, for example, or Monte Carlo and so on. So, <coughs> yeah, that's basically so. This the, we're really searching for these conformal field theories, and that's why we should be able to freely map at least that's that's one argument as i mentioned we are writing a paper about this so this uh, should come out with further explanation but essentially our point is that because this gives this suppressed decay rate uh, the energy levels will acquire very small imaginary parts on the cylinder due to this tunneling and therefore the scaling dimensions of the theory uh, will acquire very small imaginary parts. Okay, so, and that's exactly what is one of the recent uh, directions is studying these series which formally have very small imaginary parts. Uh, why is that interesting? Well, let me just mention the uh, very basic uh, thing. So, so if, if, for example, we find the theory with uh, so this this you're okay with right can erase this um, or maybe I'll just erase this part mm. so when do we get generically theories wi which are sort of uh, so there is this term complex CFT complex CFT that I was mentioning and this means that some uh, some operators at least have uh, have scaling dimensions scaling dimensions delta which have have small, uh, usually you want small imaginary part. Now, sometimes people call these series non-unitary, but I think this is worse than non-unitary, right? Like, for example, as I mentioned, the, the typical non-unitary, what people used to call non-unitary series 
uh, non-unitary is when delta is less than this unitarity bound d minus 2 over 2, but delta is real, right? This happens in many examples in statistical mechanics. For example, this yang li theory that I mentioned. Uh, this happens uh, in many examples in statistical mechanics. Examples in statistical field theory. In fact, if you read like this uh, original paper on two-dimensional CFT by Belavin, Polakov, Zamolodchikov, they, they basically define a whole fa family of so-called minimal models, of which most were non-unitary. The, there is some subfamily which is unitary, but most were non-unitary, and, and some were known to correspond to, like, I think a very basic example is called the Yang-Li theory goes back to some uh, critical point of easing model in complex magnetic field or something. So this is what people usually mean by, uh, by non-unitary. But what if you have actually a small imaginary part? That's much weirder, right? That's what you would maybe call a metastable theory or uh, then you would I would say it's worse than non-unitary, it's uh, not fully stable. Uh, so there is no perfect criticality in this theory. Right? So it's, uh, you can call it metastable. Metastable CFT. And there is no true criticality. But there is something similar, no true critical point. I think a very, uh, very nice example is provided by this scenario, which I mentioned also yesterday, which has to do with merger, of mer merger and disappearance of fixed points. Uh, remember that part, like when I showed the, the slide? So there, was, uh, th there were many examples before, but there is a nice paper called Conformality Lost by uh, David B. Kaplan, I think Stefanov, Son, and uh, there was a fourth author, Gian, I think, but, but let me just say it's uh, David B. Kaplan et al. Uh, B. Kaplan uh, et al. Uh, and this paper is called Conformality Lost. <coughs> Conformality Lost. And they had a very compelling general picture, which I'm about to show, of what happens uh, when, when uh, you vary some parameters in, in some beta function equation. So, so suppose you, this paper was in 2009, I think. But I think it kind of inspired people a lot. And in some sense, this complex CFT work is, in s is a bit of an outgrowth of, of this work. Okay, so let me show a very simple example, which is applicable, for, for instance, to the model that I was talking about, this ON model. Suppose you have a beta function uh, for one coupling. So beta of G which in some region can be approximated as g minus g naught squared minus a. Some very generic behavior, right? So, so you, have, uh, you have beta as a function of g, and, uh, and you have this parabolic dependence. This is g naught, and this is a, like when a is positive. Right. So when A is uh, positive, it's clear that there are two fixed points, right? Uh, one of them is IR stable and the other one is UV stable. So if you draw the flow lines towards IR, they basically look like this. 
So this is the IR stable fixed point, stable, and this is UV stable. And basically, there are two solutions. So beta equals 0 has these two solutions, two real solutions, which are uh, g star is equal to g0 plus or minus square root of a. But then let's imagine varying this parameter a uh, reducing it and then it changes sign. So then th as you start raising this, right, these two intersections will get closer, closer, then they will both collapse to G naught, right? So when A, uh, when A is equal to zero, the fixed points have merged. Points merge merge, right? And when, when A is less than zero, they become co complex conjugate. Uh, become complex conjugate. And that's when basically the two, uh, two physical fixed points have merged and disappeared, but they've really gone into a complex plane. Right, and then the situation looks like this, right? So F when A is less than zero, but very small, for example, suppose you can make it very small, then this looks like, uh, so this is again our G zero, but then the flow does not, there are no more physical fixed points. So a real physical system Will, uh, will not stop, right? It will not reach the scale invariant phase. But nevertheless, if this is tiny, it can spend, it can, the RG flow really slows down near here, right? And you know what this is called? Uh, it's walking dynamics, no? Walking behavior. Yeah, this is what people call walking. And this showed up, for example, in uh, early on, people talked about walking technicolor, so just basically making beta function very small, right? So, so the actual physical physical RG flow RG flow exhibits uh, exhibits walking behavior. Walking behavior. Uh, uh. So if you can dial this A to be really tiny, it's very hard to distinguish this, this theory from an actual fixed point, right? For example, uh, in a lattice experiment, you know, usually you make lattice as big as you can, but you may not be able to see any difference between this picture and the slightly negative A. And what our hope is, is that in this ON model, this effectively this a is actually exponentially small so so this uh, so this gives basically so when a is less than zero then the the fixed points are actually at complex coupling right there like a g naught plus or minus i square root of minus a but if this quantity is really tiny you may pick up very very small imaginary parts and uh, and this behavior seems quite generic, actually. <coughs> uh, even a few years before this conformality lost paper, uh, there was a paper I wrote with uh, Demarski and Roybon. So we had uh, Demarski, uh, Roybon, uh, and me. And we studied some uh, j large class of examples, which are, uh, this should become clearer soon, or befalls of n equal 4 super n mills. They, they're some kind of non-supersymmetric, uh, non-supersymmetric four-dimensional gauge theories with multiple gauge groups. And we found these type of, com you know, situations like this, where 
the, the complex point is not perfectly uh, real. I mean, the, the fixed point is not perfectly real. And then, more recently, like, uh, this, this is what is believed to happen right outside the so-called conformal window. And I'll explain what conformal window means. Uh, means. Okay, so, so usually this is uh, right, it happens right outside outside uh, conformal window. Uh, has uh, have some of you heard the term conformal window? No. How about line of fixed points? I mean, this is basically the same thing. Like when you have confor conformality for a certain range of parameters. And here this parameter is basically A. So the conformality persists as long as A is positive, right? But the moment A hits zero, that's, that's where your line of fixed points ends. And then the moment it's less than zero, then it's no longer strictly conformal. Okay. So I should say that none of these issues uh, come up in the Gro uh, gross nouveau yukawa model. Right there, everything is perfectly stable and real, and that defines a fully conformal field theory for, uh, for any number of flavors, as, as I mentioned. Okay, so fair enough. So now I will soon actually talk about conformal window in four-dimensional non-abelian gauge theory, where you'll see some of the same stuff appearing. Okay, so now let me come back to, to this uh, story with um, the story with non-abelian gauge fields and the Hoft limit. Right, in that case, uh, just one second. to find the right pages. Yeah, so why do some of us like this uh, Toft large end limit so much? Uh, because in many ways it, pr uh, it simplifies the theory, but it preserves a lot of its physical features, namely confinement, uh, dimensional transmutation, and things like that. Uh, so le let, <laughs> let me uh, come back to this uh, large n counting. So th these are just the vacuum diagrams. So I said that if uh, if we adopt this Toft limit, Toft large n and limit limit keeping keeping lambda, which is g. Yang mil squared n fixed. <coughs> then the diagrams organize nicely by their topology, right? So, for example, uh, you s you say that uh, the number of degrees of freedom is obviously n squared. So all planar diagrams, all planar planar vacuum. Diagrams should be of order n squared. Okay, and uh, and I already showed some of this. Uh, for example, uh, the simple uh, the simplest one could be you know with a cubic coupling <laughs> is this one, and then we we can redraw it in this double line notation, and then we just have. Right, so, so how many index loops are there here? There, is, there are three index loops, right, in the double line notation. So, so this diagram behaves like g young mills squared, uh, 
times n cube, right, which is n squared lambda. Right, and in, indeed there is an overall n squared, and then lambda comes out. Then you draw a more complicated uh, planar graph, uh, and uh, and then here you get uh, one, two, three, four index loops. Right, so there will be n to the four. Uh, so this contributes g n mills to the four. Uh, n to the 4, right, which is n squared times lambda squared. So the sum of planar graphs, sum of uh, planar graphs, graphs is really n squared times some function of lambda. This is in general still very hard to solve, but there are some simple toy models where you replace, for example, the four-dimensional gauge theory by just an integral over a matrix, where this function can be easily computed. And this, this actually is uh, discussed in, in my notes, like the notes that I ended out, if you're curious. So this is not in general computable, so this f of lambda is not uh, in general general computable. But there are toy models starting from the paper by Brezen, Itzikson, Parisi, and Zuber. For example, uh, BIPZ computed it for a matrix integral like where the, all the n counting is exactly the same, but you can, for example, write down the integral over Hermitian matrix phi, which is a bit like a, uh, like a gluon, just one component of a gluon, right? And then we take e to the minus uh, trace of phi squared plus g phi cubed. And then in this model, you can basically do this calculation. And the sum over planar graphs can be calculated in, in this model. But I, I probably won't have time to talk about this. But at least if you're curious, you can look at this, uh, these lecture notes. But now, what about non-planar diagrams? Well, here I drew a simple non-planar diagrams a diagram, and, uh, and here if you do the counting of parameters, it has the same power of G young mills, but instead of n to the 4, you can see that there are only two index loops, one outer one, and then uh, all of this is just one loop, right? So, so this is a non-planar graph which goes like G young mills to the 4, now times n squared. So now this is uh, simply uh, lambda squared without the power of n squared. Mm. Right, so this is just lambda squared. And then similarly, you can start dressing up this diagram by additional things and, and none of this will change the power. Just this single crossing is costing you n squared. So in this theory, you have the following general property that if you take this log z and divide by n squared, there is this, uh, uh, the leading term will be f0 of lambda plus there will be one over n squared uh, correction times f1 of lambda plus 1 over n to the 4 f2 of lambda and so on. And these are just some complicated functions of lambda. So unlike, unlike this uh, uh, vector on lim uh, limit that we discussed which was completely analytic, analytically tractable in any dimension, here, for example, if I ask you to do this computation for, 
for large NQCD, uh, no one knows how to do it. Okay, so it simplifies the theory, it filters out a subclass of diagrams, like these diagrams are just thrown out in the leading Hoft limit, only the planar ones remain, but they're still hard to solve. But this is still like a really big deal, right? A really big simplification. Uh, so, so how do we prove in general that this, this is what happens? Uh, so let's just think about uh, uh, the, co the computation we're doing. So let me write the So if, if I write the action of the Young-Mills theory as minus 1 over 2G Young-Mills squared in this parameterization times integral d dx, trace f mu nu squared, right? Uh, then you see that this is actually, this can be written as n divided by lambda, right? So if we're interested in counting powers of n, we don't really even care about lambda, right? But then you, you, see, you see the following thing, that each propagator, each propagator contributes uh, a factor of 1 over n, right? Because the term dA squared is multiplied by n, so when you invert it, you get 1 over n, right? Each vertex, uh, for now let me just focus on cubic vertices. E so each vertex, uh, either cubic or quartic, contributes a power of n. Okay, and each face, we saw that each face is, is an index loop, right? So each face, uh, uh, face of a graph, is also contributing an n because it's an index loop. Right, so what is the net power of n in a graph, right? It's simply n, n to the power uh, face, faces plus, plus vertices. So this is the number of faces, uh, number of faces, this is number of vertices, uh, vertices, and these are edges or propagators, right? But, but this is uh, exactly the uh, Euler theorem. So the Euler theorem tells us that uh, if you take any discretized graph, uh, you find that, uh, so Euler basically taught us that uh, F plus V minus E is equal to the Euler characteristic chi, okay? Where, and this is equal to 2 minus 2G. <laughs> okay, so face, you, it needs a little bit of explanation. Think about this as dr being drawn on a sphere. So for example, this graph here has four faces. Because, uh, yeah, the, there will be, so this is a face, right? This is a face, this is a face, and the back of it is a face. Okay, so, so this one, for example, has f equal to 4. Okay, and how many, uh, yeah, you always have to imagine, even though it's drawn on a plane, right? The plane can be then sort of brought around the point at infinity to a sphere. So you count the outside as a face. Okay, so outside this counted as another. Outside adds, always adds one to the number of faces to F. 
is this pretty clear? Because you just think of it as, as being drawn on an actual sphere, right? And then you look how many separate, you know, faces there are after you. So it's kind of the discretization of a sphere where you've drawn some graph on a sphere with some number of edges and some number of vertices. Right, so, and everything will work. Uh, for, for us, the face is literally the number of the, these loops. Like uh, these, <coughs> when you think about double line notation, that's why the outer index loop is always counted as a face. Right, and, and this always works. Yeah, like uh, as an exercise, since this is Germany, you can do the, c this is homework, do the counting for the Mercedes di diagram, <laughs> right? The, yeah, this is what people usually call the Mercedes diagram, right? Somewhat squished version of it, but right? Just c do the counting and it's obviously planar, right? So, so this will when you do it right, it will give you n squared. But okay, so this is basically the, the core reason why this works. So this is just n to the n to the two minus two g, right? And this is uh, so. So this is in general like sum. So this is the sum over genus from zero to infinity. Uh, of n minus 2g, right, f, fg of lambda. <coughs> okay, I already divided by n squared. Right, this is all what happens in orientable theories. This is, in this case, you always get orientable surfaces. And then the everything goes in powers of uh, n squared. Uh, the what gives it orientability is that that there are arrows on on these edges. Okay, there are other theories where, for example, for a Hermitian matrix, when it's Hermitian, uh, then it's you get orientable diagrams. But when it's purely real, you get non-orientable. For non-orientable, you also have these uh, more complicated things called the real projective plane, RP2, where you insert some kind of a cross cap. I won't talk about it. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit explained in, in my notes, but you get like more funny topologies like Klein bottle uh, and one thing that I will say is that uh, what happens if you add uh, quarks to the theory? Uh, quarks actually add boundaries, and boundaries um, boundaries also cause only corrections of order one over n rather than uh, one over n squared. So, uh, so this is a feature of. So this, uh, so in pure, what we learned is in pure glue theory. In pure glue theory, theory, the expansion, expansion is in powers. Is in powers of one over n squared. Okay, if you also add fermions to the theory, then uh, you get the following additional graphs. Like you can always, for example, insert, uh, insert a fermion loop, right? Uh, you can insert a fermion loop. And the fermion loop actually changes the, the genus. Then you, you have a disk instead of the sphere. And that's actually, so whenever there is a fermion loop, it, instead of uh, n squared, it, you get a power, uh, you multiply it by the number of fermion flavors divided by n. Okay, so if the number of fermion flavors is held fixed in the large n limit, this is uh, just nf times n. And n looks like genus one half, 
in some sense, right? So, so once you include holes, then the story gets more complicated. Uh, but the the, uh, the simplest story is for this pure glue theory without without uh, flavors. So let me just for now talk about the pure glue theory, and uh, let's just go back to something really simple like the asymptotic freedom, and uh, and and check that that this large end limit does not sort of everything is consistent. So let's recall the beta function equation for QCD. QCD, so beta function for SUN gauge theory. SUN gauge theory. Let's say coupled to indeed NF uh, NF uh, Dirac fermions. And now we are just taking d equal four, right? Where the this coupling lambda is dimensionless and so on. Right, so this is the formula that I'm sure all of you have seen, right? It's in Peskin and Schroeder and any text, any textbook on that covers on abelian gauge theory. You see that there is beta g, which is d d g young mills d log m, and here usually people parameterize it as some beta function coefficients, so the leading one is g n mills cube divided by 4 pi squared, then minus b1 g n mills to the fifth power, four, 4 pi to the 4, and so on. Okay, so this is the one loop, one that won a Nobel Prize for Gross and Wilczek and Pulitzer. So this is uh, Gross, Wilczek, Pulitzer, 1973. Now, uh, recently people have computed uh, one loop. From what I understand, the uh, uh, five loop is now completely available in full generality, and I think some of it was done in Germany. There, there were, I think, two or three independent groups that cross-checked each other. So now we know up to five loops, which is an amazing accomplishment, is known. But I will mostly, I will actually say something about two loop, because two loop gives you some dramatic new phenomenon that I want to mention. But, but let's first check that the one loop is okay. So, so for this SUN case, B0 is equal to 11 thirds n, right, minus 2 thirds nf. This is the golden equation. And let's for now keep nf fixed in the large n limit, right, so you can just ignore it. This is a subleading correction. Then you see that uh, you can rewrite this equation as d by, <coughs> so if you divide by g young mills cube and by this n, you get the equation that d by d log m of 1 over g young mills squared n is just equal to a constant, right? It's 11 over 24 pi squared. Okay, this is in the one loop approximation plus some small corrections, right? So you see the appearance of that Hoft coupling here, right? So the inverse Hoft coupling just flows at the rate of order one, which is exactly what you expect from a smooth large end limit, right? So if you plot the, the how this one over lambda depends on log on log uh, uh, on the scale, right? Uh, It's just linear, 
right? And it hits zero exactly, you know what this is called, the, the scale where it hits zero. Anybody know? Lambda QCD, right? I mean, this is where, if you just extrapolate it back, this is where the, couple, the f theory formally becomes infinitely coupled, right? So, so this here, what happens here is, we call this lambda QCD. And this is a scale of order one that, that just appears through. So this is what people call dimensional transmutation, right? Where, where you start with a dimensionless lambda, but then you, you get some scale which you can choose in real world it's around 200 MeV or something like that which sets the scale for bound state masses and this is where I mean of course this cannot be this is an extrapolation back to strong coupling but but I, I mean there are lots of people here I think who know this better than me but but this is the essential story. If you extrapolate back, you hit this uh, formal divergence. Okay, and the strong coupling in the infrared at the scale of around 200 MeV is what causes, uh, uh, causes the formation of bound states, basically confinement. So in this pure glue case... Uh, Can I ask yeah, thing? yeah. Is this in some sense similar to a Landau pole? Yeah, but it happens in... Yeah, Landau pole is a more severe problem. This is just a difficulty of extrapolating the theory to low enough momentum scales. It just shows that you exit the regime of perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. But the theory is extremely well defined at short distances, right? That's why people call QCD such a golden theory. Because at short... If you go to... So large scale, one over lambda, uh, lambda gets large, so lambda becomes small, and you can do. So this is, this is the region of PQCD, but then you clearly exit this region in, uh, in here. Then you have to do something. That's why we're talking about large n expansions because it, the theory is very hard to solve in in this region. And uh, so I, I just did this to show that. Uh, partly to preview something else I'll do, but to show that this uh, 1 over Toft, so it's really the Toft coupling that flows logarithmically in large n QCD with the rate of order 1, right? And then you get uh, the, so this large n QCD becomes a theory of weakly interacting glue, glue balls. So you get a, uh, so you get a theory theory of weakly interacting interacting globals and mesons if you add globals and mesons and this is basically what Hoft showed in 1974 uh, right uh, and then Witten wrote uh, there is also so there is a very nice paper also by Witten who showed how to incorporate variants into this large N theory. <coughs> but he also, <coughs> he also has a very beautiful review of this whole subject. So I highly recommend reading this, this paper. I think it's from the late 70s. So how do we see this? Uh, so let me just uh, show from something that you've already seen in, uh, in Graham's lectures. So if you just take this chiral Lagrangian, chiral Lagrangian, uh, lambda, which is equal to trace. So you have like f pi squared over 4 trace d mu d mu u d, d mu u dagger plus some corrections right 
I think Graham was calling this sigma. I mean, I don't know. Some people call this sigma. Some people call it u. But uh, u is essentially an exponential of the pion field. So u is an SU2 matrix if you have to write flavors. And, uh, and u is equal to e to the i sigma dot pi divided by uh, f pi. f pi is the pi and decay constant. And then it turns out that, uh, so then you can just uh, start expanding this in powers of pions, right? So you will get that there will be first the term 1 half d mu pi squared. And then there will be some terms like uh, 1 over f pi squared times d mu pi squared all squared, and so on. OK, and, and the crucial thing is that this f pi, f pi actually uh, is of order square root of n, where f pi squared is of order n. Yeah, f pi squared is of order n in large n QCD. So because of that, you see that this quartic pion interaction is suppressed by 1 over n. So you get, uh, you can see it also from these elementary diagrams, uh, what happens. For example, uh, yeah, you can draw the diagrams that describe, for example, the splitting of a meson in two mesons and then rejoining. For example, this kind of diagram describes propagation of a meson. It's a quark loop. Uh, so this is just a quark loop at the boundary. And this describes the propagation of a meson. Then you can also describe this diagram with an additional hole. Uh, as a So we already saw that this is suppressed by an additional 1 over n. But you can also think about this as uh, some meson that sp splits into two, then rejoins. And from here, you see that the three meson coupling constant, three meson coupling is of order, uh, is of order s one over square root of n. And this is also, uh, there are various uh, review reviews of, of this. Uh, one review I know is the one I wrote back in the late 80s about skirmia, skirm model. So you can find it on, it was before archives, so, but you can still find it on my Inspire publication list where a lot of this is explained. Okay, uh, so you see that because of this suppression, the the four meson, uh, the four pi and vertex, four pi and vertex uh, is of order one over n. So you get like basically very weakly interacting uh, mesons, and the same same story for globals. I mean, globals in nature are very hard to observe because of the presence of dynamical quarks. There is mixing between between uh, globals and singlet mesons. From the point of view, as I mentioned last time, from the point of view of string theory, you think of a global as a closed string and the meson as an open string. So there is a diagram which uh, gives you global, global meson mixing. mixing. Uh, global me uh, meson mixing, which basically corresponds to uh, this is a meson. The, there, there is a quark here and an anti-quark. They come together and annihilate, and then you just get a closed string. So it's obtained from through annihilation of the quark and anti-quark. And this mixing is also suppressed at one over n, but in real world n is not that large, so. 
so it's very hard to tell uh, where the glue balls are like if uh, uh, but but in the large end theory it would be a lot easier then yeah I just wanted to mention very briefly where the baryons are in large end QCD do do you want to hear that because uh, <laughs> baryons are kind of important but yeah I mean the uh, this is actually one inter uh, really interesting direction that caught on a lot, uh, which is if you so meson is something that just contains a quark and an anti quark, right? So if the mass of the quark is whatever it is, uh, I don't know, five, five MeV, you crank up the number of colors, it's not going to change the mass of the meson. So. So the meson masses don't grow at large n, right? They just stay of order one. And the same for glue balls. So, so meson and glue ball. Yes. So um, in the, even if you add uh, non so how can this be proportional to one over square root n? I thought like if you do the counting with the loops, and even if you have fermions, you only get powers of, like even powers of n. Yeah, but the, uh, yeah, this, uh, because there are two powers of coupling constant there. Like this diagram, okay, this has two, this is uh, F3, right, the three meson coupling. So you get F3 squared, and this is one over N. Because, yeah, the diagram had an additional hole in it. Yeah, the additional hole costs you just one power of one over N. Yeah, if it were handle, then it would be 1 over n squared. Like, for example, the 3 glue ball. So this is a 3, so three meson coupling. Uh, coupling is of order 1 over root n, but 3 glue ball coupling is actually of order 1 over n. Because, uh, yeah, because then the, you have to add the handle. Yeah, and this is exactly the systematics of string theory, actually, that, that the three open string coupling and three clo uh, closed string coupling are related in this way. One is the square of, of another. So if anyone tells you string theory is not totally detached from reality, it's, it's not true because, I mean, uh, <laughs> Well, at least it gives, you, it gives you some very interesting ways to think even about large NQCD. That, uh, and the I'll question comes mm -hmm. if this is related to real. <laughs> no, this, this I think uh, many people use. Uh, I mean, that's, this is definitely a pretty mainstream uh, field. I mean, y you can say that one of our N expansions is sort of a mathematical crutch to get hold of a theory, but but there are some some examples where large n limit actually is physical. That uh, not not in yeah, I would say like just conceptually, if you want to, we are maybe a bit unlucky that we're stuck with three uh, n color equal to three, mm -hmm. because for example, all the Reggie trajectories only go like a couple states and then they start getting very broad. But if instead of three, the number of colors were even I don't know, 13 or something like that. It would be so much easier to solve. Like there would be a very clean structure of many well-identified Reggie trajectories and, and all the states would be much narrower. So, so that's why, I don't know, some often real world sits at the hardest place. But, but if you first think about, say, QCD at somewhat bigger number of colors, it's a very clean separation between interactions and propagation of states and so on. Is this large end approximation only useful for theories where you don't have a small coupling constant, therefore you cannot expand in this? Or are there also examples of theories where even though the coupling constant is small and you could also do the well, yeah, it still works, but there it's not as important. You, if the, for example, the, as I said, uh, epsilon expansion, you can just do it happily at small number of colors, and and uh, and then you don't so much need it. 
usually when there is both the small coupling and large n, it, it still improves the quality of expansion. But yeah, just one, since we were talking about the, uh, the picture, uh, why, why string theory has something to do with real world. I mean, the, this uh, chu frauchi plot, like, essentially, how do you describe a high-spin meson, right? High, high-spin uh, meson is like, it descri it's described like this. You have a quark and an anti-quark, and then there is some kind of flux tube between them. And, uh, and this, this we call the the chroma chroma electric flux tube like the whole the whole notion of confinement has to do with this conjecture which appears to be completely correct that when you for example when you're in this regime right and you look at the quark anti quark uh, for example in QED when you look at uh, a dipole, right? The field just spreads all over space. You, you all know dipole pattern. But this is not going to happen at, in this regime, right? You, you basically see that when you separate the quark and an anti-quark like this, the field is going to get collimated, right? Instead of, instead of the field lines going sort of like this, they all bunch up. And that's why we get the linear potential. Uh, between quark and anti-quark. You stretch it. So that's why the... and so you get the V Q Q bar. The linear potential is if equal to this uh, T, the string tension, uh, times R. Right? This is for... and this is for R much... Uh, so this is true for R much bigger than 1 over lambda QCD. In reality, it sets in even at smaller. So, so what happens is that if you bring them very close so that you're in perturbative regime, the potential is logarithmic. But then it quickly crosses over into linear potential. And this people can see very cleanly on, on a lattice. So, so for example, if you read any lattice paper, you will see the word string tension. So string theory is there. <laughs> 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 right, but but even before people figured this all out, there was this uh, phenomenological picture of, of high spin mesons as just strings that are spinning around like this. And if you do a simple calculation, and if you ignore the quark masses and do a simple calculation in relativistic string theory, you basically see that, uh, that the uh, spin of the meson uh, is is equal to alpha prime times the mass squared of the meson. Okay, and this is called the the Reggie slope or Reggie slope. So you get this linear you get this linear relation between the spin and the Reggie slope, and this actually is very well obeyed by the by the leading rigid trajectories. Uh, so it works pretty well, uh, works OK up to like J of order. This actually works both for mesons and baryons for of order 11 halves. And this is probably still the best phenomenological evidence for, for string theory that you, you see these rather nice linear relations for between spin and mass squared. <coughs> and this goes back, the, this phenomenology goes back to the 60s, actually. So, <coughs> so now we understand a bit better how to derive it from, uh, from string models. But, um, Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you call a three meson coupling and three Dubot coupling? Just in the effective Lagrangian. For example, in, in this, uh, Lagrangian here, first of all, you can introduce other mesons, right? You can introduce rho meson and, and so on. You just write some effective, S effective, 
S effective, which is sum over all mesons, like d mu uh, phi i squared, right? And then uh, sum over i, and then you will have some f i j k, roughly speaking, phi i phi j phi k. Just the triple meson couplings. It just describes, for example, decay of rho meson into two pions, right? Yeah, rho uh, things like that, but just schematically. And this always has, uh, this behaves like 1 over square root of n. Okay, that's, yeah, here I'm being schematic. I'm dropping, like, derivatives and things like that. Mm. Where does the one of the square root of n come from? Uh, well, it comes from this counting. Like you have to go back to actual quark diagrams describing. That's what I was trying to do. Like, if you think about the meson as this object, the quark and an anti-quark with some glue between them. So, so to describe these processes, you have to go back to summing these planar diagrams and. Uh, so this really comes from QCD picture, right? This is, uh, yeah, initially people, like in the 60s, people knew about a lot of mesons. They were just writing down these type of effective Lagrangians. But this is what comes from, uh, comes from large and QCD. Okay, so, so large n QCD does definitely simplify in the, this large n limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you explain why does the mass of a meson and the mass of a global are independent of n? Uh, well, e each one is not made of order n stuff, right? Like the simplest uh, global creation operator is trace f mu nu squared, for example. <coughs> so you can make a global out of two gluons, essentially, or three gluons. Uh, so because of that, you don't have a, an order n sort of constituents. You only have just two constituents. But the baryons are different. Like to, to make a baryon, this is actually <coughs> huge difference between baryons and mesons that for to make a baryon to make a baryon operator <coughs> you need n quarks right a baryon by definition consists of n quarks so you you have this anti-symmetric tensor of sun and then you have q I1, QI2, QIN. Right, so then I immediately you see that if each quark, so in large NQCD, a, a baryon is a bound state of n objects. If each of them weighs something, you immediately get n times something in some leading order. And if you want to read a very beautiful, sort of more general explanation, it's in this. Witten's paper called Baryons and at large n, I think it's uh, from 1979 or 80, something like that. So, so you immediately see that its mass is uh, mass scales like n. And that seems like you could immediately argue, again, at n equals 3, there is not a huge separation between the lightest baryon mass and and for example, rho meson mass. Rho meson is only weighs like three, 200 few, uh, GeV less, right? Uh, 200 MeV less. So, <coughs> but if you, again, if we had the luxury of working with bigger N, then you would see this very clean separation. And actually there is, so this is something that I did as a grad student, uh, worked on this uh, picture. So how do you describe baryons in this effective uh, chiral Lagrangian? Uh, they're actually described as topological solitons. So as, uh, have some of you heard about this? 
or uh -huh. I think I see so but most of you have not heard so maybe I'll mention this so and this actually is a model that was invented long before QCD so Bar uh, so baryon is basically a heavy semi-classical object and there is something called the skirm model of baryons uh, skirm skirm model of baryons in large N QCD. Well, initially it was just invented as a model of baryons in the 1950s. Right. Uh, but then around 1983, uh, 1983, Witten connected it with large N QCD. Connected it with large N QCD. And basically what the SCAR model was, was just take this effective Lagrangian and, uh, and U is just some SU2 matrix. So you can uh, parameterize the SU2, mat uh, SU2 matrix can be expanded. So SU2 group uh, is in general written like this. It's U is equal to u naught plus i u dot sigma, where u naught times the identity matrix. So it's a two by two special unitary matrix with the constraint that u naught squared plus u vector squared is equal to one. And these are just the three Pauli matrices. Pauli matrices. So w this describes a sphere and four dimensions, right? Or three, dimen uh, three sphere. So this is just uh, S3. So there is some isomor isomorphism between SU2 group and uh, three sphere. And this is what uh, Skirm basically noticed. And he said, let's consider solitons, uh, which as you go through three dimensional space, they're com completely wrapped around this SU2 group. Okay, uh, and so the SCARM topological soliton, people often call them SCARMions, SCARMion topological soliton. Soliton is, uh, is described by the following function of so it's a map from R3 to S, SU2. But if you say that, you know, if you add to R3 the point at infinity, namely, if everything approaches the same, the same value as you go to infinity of R3, then this is really like a map from S3 to S3. Because R3 with an extra point at infinity is like a sphere. Uh, it's same as like if you add to the Riemann, uh, Riemann plane, you add the point at infinity, it's just a sphere. It's a Riemann sphere. So, so with the idea of SCARM was to write the following ansatz, u of r is e to the i sigma dot r hat, the unit vector times some function of the radius where uh, this profile function has the value that f of 0 is pi and f at infinity is, uh, approaches zero. 0. So there is just some kind of profile function that goes from uh, pi to, uh, to 0. This is f. And when you think about it, it's an extremely clever ansatz because when you actually you can expand this as cosine f of r plus i sigma dot r hat sine f of r. So you see that at the origin uh, the value of the field is minus one, at infinity it's plus one. 
so you're sort of sweeping the sphere from the South Pole to the North Pole, like so. Uh, so u of zero is minus one, which is like the South Pole, and u of infinity is plus one. And in between, you're sort of going from the South Pole to the North Pole and sweeping. So it's uh, it's a bit easier to think about two-dimensional analog. Right, where you map, uh, like imagine uh, mapping S2 to S2. You could just imagine a rubber balloon, right? You sort of uh, put it over some solid sphere and tie it, and then you cannot untie it anymore. So, uh, so any sort of lesson of topology begins, for example, with maps of S1 to S1, where you take a rubber band, right, uh, and wrap it some number of times around some solid circle and tie it. And this winding number then cannot be destroyed. So, so there is some unit, uh, some uh, winding, so there is a conserved winding. Conserved uh, winding. And similarly you can do it for any SN to SN and in this particular case uh, the winding number can be written, there is a neat formula for this winding number uh, which is um, so this formula is uh, So this, so this winding number is identified with baryon number. Identified with baryon number. And the formula is B is equal to 1 over 24 pi squared integral d d3x epsilon i j k trace d i d i u u dagger d j u u dagger d k u u dagger and basically skirm realized that this this gives i think this is a formula from mathematical literature even but the big leap is to identify this with a conserved baryon number and this baryon number cannot be destroyed. Like, if you plug in this ansatz to this formula, this u of r, you get exactly baryon number one. So, so for this u skirm, you get that provided f of zero is pi and f of infinity is zero, you get baryon number one. So, so b is equal to one for uh, for skirmion. Oh, yes. Uh, can we be inspired from the Abelian anomaly since this term we solve all the transformers number of the SU to the H fields and this is the baryon number which is related in that? Yeah, I think there is a way to think about this as computing some induced induced uh, fermion number in, in this background by integrating. I think this is one of the ways in which this can be explained in large NQCD. But you have to then imagine some theory where u is coupled to quarks still, then you integrate out quarks. and There is a more general formula for baryon current where you yeah, where the baryon current you just have like B mu and then here you erase this right and then you'll have like epsilon yeah sorry B say B L and here you put epsilon I J K L so this this current is conserved it happens to be conserved identically like it's not conserved using it's uh, an example of this topological currents where you don't have to use equations of motion to show that it's conserved. It's just an identity that that d d l b l is exactly equal to zero. 
So people had a lot of fun working with this. Uh, there is one, one subtle thing that if you just leave this leading term, then this skirmian will just collapse to zero and will not be stable. But uh, what skirm added originally is a stabilizing term for this soliton, which was like 1 over, uh, let's say, uh, 1 over 8 e squared trace d mu u u dagger d nu u u dagger all squared. This kind of nice commutator term. And many people worked with this formulation, including Witten originally. You can think of this term as an effective term you get when you integrate out a rho meson, which is sort of a very important uh, resonance in the 2 pi n channel. So in some sense, this is loosely speaking, like comes from, from uh, rho meson, integrating out rho meson. Uh, rho mu. And then with this you can just compute the mass of the soliton, you can compute the excitations and all kinds of stuff. And uh, <coughs> I actually uh, wrote my basically very first or second paper was on uh, uh, infinite nuclear matter where you take a uh, a lattice of these skirmions, like a cubic lattice. So, and in fact, this may have some physical application because if you, may, maybe I'll just say, say it at the very beginning of the next lecture since you're probably hungry or, but th this could be a good time to stop for questions. This is just some phenomenological coefficient that you can... For, I mean, the flaw in this model is that in reality there is really an infinite number of higher derivative terms because you cannot stop. <coughs> uh, but it's also, it's large n scaling has to be taken to be 1 over e squared is of order n. And then the mass of the soliton was... Uh, you, for example, find that uh, mass of the soliton uh, uh, was of order f pi over this parameter e. So this parameter e did come in very important, and and you people usually fit it to there. There is some then there is this whole story of uh, semi-classical quantization of the soliton to obtain. Uh, nucleons and delta, uh, delta particles and so on. And this was fit in, in a certain way. But, but the details of this model are a little bit... Uh, so what's stopping people from using this model quantitatively, I think, is that it's not clear why you're only stopping with one stabilizer term or two or... So the, the, there are order one effects uh, of all kinds cropping in. But they just qualitatively, it looks like a very good model. And people used it for all sorts of qualitative things. And it incorporates exactly this picture of, of large n counting for baryons and how they should not be perturbative objects. They should be like solitonic objects. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Where did you say the stabilizer <laughs> term comes from? What? Where the stabilizer term mm -hmm. comes? Well, you could just uh, basically <coughs> there is just some uh, scaling of the of this term that shows that if I scale this function, so just with this term alone, if you make the function very sharply varying like this, it will zero, uh, make it go to zero. Okay, uh, so the mass will just go to zero and the soliton wants to shrink energetically. All you can do is just say, I need some four derivative term to prevent this from happening. But uh, I think uh, 
maybe more physical explanation is that this is a very natural term because uh, there there is some coupling term, I guess, from like you expect some. Yeah, I'm not sure I can do it from the head, but there will be some coupling of rho. So you have this rho meson d mu rho nu minus d nu rho mu. That's sort of the natural combination, and you can couple this to uh, to d mu u u dagger <coughs> commutator d nu u u dagger. So in the rho meson Lagrangian, I think there will be this type of coupling between uh, rho and and pions. I hope I'm saying the right thing, but. But then when you integrate this out, you get some, some term like this. So, so then there are, but there are many variants of the model. There is actually a variant of the model where people kept rho explicitly and did not integrate it out. It's a so-called rho stabilizer model. But you can add some other stabilizer. It doesn't matter too much what they are as long as they have more derivatives than two. But Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like to the you? <coughs> yeah, you, you you can think of as uh, it's essentially related to the condensate of the quark bilinear. Like <coughs> yeah, the U matrix is uh, so this U matrix uh, is like vacuum expectation value of Q, uh, Q, Q left bar I, uh, Q right I. Like there is this picture of chiral symmetry breaking the where the quark bilinear uh, acquires a VEV. Okay, and that's why uh, there is some F pi that I need to introduce, I think. Is it? And is it the same you describing the barrel? Yeah, the, the idea. Uh, of Witten was that now that we know QCD, like for example, why in vacuum U is just near one, right? This just corresponds to the fact that the chiral symmetry got broken. Then the, the pions are fluctuations around that state near one. That's why we are writing that that U is like. So if you expand U in small fluctuations around the identity, right? These small fluctuations are pions. So the whole picture of chiral symmetry breaking is that there are, fl there are fluctuations of the condensate that give you these physical excitations. But then you can also, th these are just fluctuations like near one. But so what if you think about the, this U making some large distortions away from one, like even for example, at the origin, it's on the other side of the group, like goes from one to minus one. And that's essentially what Skirm proposed. I think at that time, people did not know anything about quarks, but he had this kind of mathematical model, which turned out to be very nicely adaptable to. Is it, is it possible to see where the third is? Yeah, you can have uh, three by three. You can have a SU3 model. Yeah, uh, like in fact, people played a lot. Like some things are much nicer. And yeah, this uh, matrix is always NF by NF. So U is, uh, uh, yeah, you basically have this picture th where the SUNF cross SUNF chiral symmetry gets broken to S U N F, right? By the condensate. Uh, that that's the phenomenology of if you take N F massless quarks, and uh, and that's what. Uh, so you have to take N F by an uh, S U N F matrix. Yeah, people. I mean, I've actually I I worked with Callan on uh, a picture where. Instead of you just bind straight uh, kaons to the soliton to give it flavor, it's called bound state approach to flavor, and that's uh, 
sort of thinking of, of the chaos as fairly heavy and like not so light. But, but all, all these models are yeah, in the same kind of universality class. Okay. Uh, one yeah. question. Mm -hmm. How do you produce uh, this schemas? Can you hope, for instance, in the early universe when QCD gets broken, the uh, chaos symmetry mm -hmm. gets broken, that you produce some of them? Well, it, from QCD point, yeah, from Q, uh, that's like a baryogenesis question. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, from this point of view, yeah, you can sometimes from perturbative excite. In fact, people did study it this way. Like, they just have to produce uh, big excursions of the fields that produce solitons, right? Sometimes you can make soliton anti soliton pairs and stuff, but but I think Misha was a much bigger. Uh, I don't know much about bar baryogenesis. So. Okay. Okay. So, so thank you. Mm.